good morning. Welcome to worship on this first Sunday of November. Glad that you're with us. You've tuned in and are ready to worship, and I hope you've prepared for in-home communion. If not, you have a few minutes to, to do so. So hurry up and gather around, gather some bread and grape juice, and be ready as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today. Also hope you print it out or are looking at our bulletin today and make note of all those announcements that are special and pertain to you. Also, a special thanks to all those who helped make this past Wednesday night drive through mill a tremendous success. It was wonderful to see so many people here. Um, certainly did not feel like normal, but it felt like um, it was just a good day, a good day to be up here even with the rain. So thank you for everyone who made this past Wednesday possible. Also, uh, continue to lift up Tom Hewitt in your prayers. He fell a week and a half ago, and he's doing much better now. Also, I remind you, if you're coming to the church for any reason, or if you're outside for a meeting, or one of your committee meetings, please wear a mask. I hate to keep repeating this, but certainly we know that it helps prevent the spread of coronavirus, and um, at least wear it for, for the sake of someone else, and that will be greatly appreciated. May we join together now in our call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Come, because you are invited. Come, because you hunger. Come, because you will be fed. Come for healing. Come for forgiveness. Come to this place, to this space. Come to, to me, says Jesus. Just come. May we be at worship together. May we pray. Almighty and eternal God, we come today to join, to join our praises to, to the praises of all generations. We join with cherubim and seraphim, angels and archangels, apostles and prophets, disciples and martyrs, and all your saints of every age to sing, Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning in the Sanctuary video service is hymn number 263.
Amen. May we now join together in the call to confession. There comes those moments where we stand exposed, our failings, our hurtful words, our harmful ways, open for all to see. But God takes these moments and these sins, redeeming them through compassion, through compassion or love, making us new children of the living God. Let us come in these moments with our prayers to the one who waits to forgive us and make us whole. Please join me as we pray together saying, we carry our fears around with us so much like pocket lint, compassionate heart, when you would take them and, and toss them aside, spent and useless. You invite us to sit and chat with someone who, who wants to know more about you, but we're busy running errands. You give us a simple command to love, and we complicate it with rules, worries, and doubts. Forgive us, vine grower. You've planted those seeds of mercy, of hope, of grace deep within us, so we might bear rich and nourishing fruit for others. May we not get in the way of your gardener, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who will use the Holy Spirit to bring forth an abundant crop. Amen. Hear now the words of forgiveness. God abides in you. God is breathing, living, forgiving, restoring you in this moment and in the days to come. This is the good news for us. As God is in us, so we can live, work, care for others, so that love, hope, and joy might touch all people. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. At this time, I invite all the young people to gather around once again for our children's moment. And I hope you'll be able to see this. I have a, a Bible in my hand this morning. I hope Seth can see that. You need to look carefully. Um, hopefully, you're reading the Bible. But sometimes, just sometimes when we perhaps are young Christians, we, we read the Bible and we turn the pages and we don't see anything. We don't see anything but, but blank pages. Nothing is there. Have you ever done that or even felt like that, even as an adult? Sometimes when I read the Bible, if my spirit is not right, I don't see anything but blank pages. And then I start to pray about it. I start to pray, and then what happens when I pray? Well, when I pray, I start to see a little bit better. I start to see black and white pages, and maybe even color pages. But most of the times, when I just see black and white when I'm just praying. But then when God really touches my heart and really opens the Bible up to me, I see beautiful color pages in the Bible. The Bible comes to life. Not just blank pages, but colorful life-giving pages. I hope you can see all that, and I hope you will pick up the Bible this week and, and see what you see, and trust God that it will come to life and be colorful. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word made alive in our lives today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Today's scripture reading, once again, will be a video reading. I'm sure you will enjoy it, or I hope you will. The scripture passage this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 51 through 58. Listen and watch carefully. Jesus said to the crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This is indeed the Word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. May we pray together. Gracious God, we pause now to hear your Word. Silence in us any voice but your own, so we will hear and faithfully respond. Amen. In the Gospel of John, there is no story, no story of the upper room experience during the last week of Jesus' earthly life. We really do not know why, but we do know that the Lord's Supper is obviously important in the community for whom John has written his story of Jesus. That same sacrament, this same sacrament, is vitally important to us. So today as we celebrate we will closely examine the words of of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. Note with me, first of all, this morning, note the source of the bread which is eaten. Note the source. The bread, says Jesus, came down from heaven. It is God who is the source of this bread, this gift. The God who sent Jesus into the world is a God of Tremendous compassion. Tell me, what, what's the most memorized verse in the Bible? You're right, John 3.16, you know it. For God so loved the world. Compassion. Bishop James Armstrong used to be the professor of preaching at, at Isla Seminary in, in Denver. Well, he tells of an experience that illustrates this proof this proof of of compassion. His father, a minister, was warm-hearted, lovable, and a most remarkable man. Years before, when James was a college student, they were walking through a park in a desert, in a desert town in, in Southern California. And a woman approached from the other direction. And as she passed, the father went to her and said, You seem to be in trouble. Yes, you're in trouble. How can I help you? And in that moment, the woman slumped on a park bench and began to cry, sobbing. She began to cry. She and her husband, traveling from a distant state, were driving through a mountain pass. And a little boy darted from behind a rock and 
into the road. And the car, unfortunately, struck and killed the boy. Her husband was with the boy's family. And now she was alone, seeking help, terrified. And the father was there, James's father was just there for, for compassion. Now what did James's father see? What had he seen to make him respond like he responded? What was it about him that responded so quickly and so compassionately? Well, I believe some people just have that gift, right? Some people just have that feeling. They know when someone is hurting. and They know when someone needs a, a loving comment or maybe needs a loving shoulder to cry on. Well, God is like that, right? Yes, God is like that, always looking into the depths of our being and seeing our pain. Yes, and seeing our hurt. God then comes to comfort and to console us, to strengthen us and equip us for, for the rest of the journey. The gift of Christ through the bread and through the cup is another way that God has given for us to be in fellowship with Him. Now note, please, the results of this bread. Unlike the fathers of old who ate the manna in the wilderness, those who eat this bread will not die, but will live. Jesus said earlier that eating His flesh and drinking His blood provides eternal life Life now and life everlasting in the future as well. You know, we humans fear death, right? We fear as deeply that life will not have any meaning, any real significance. So much of what we do is in an attempt to escape the reality of death and the futility of senseless living. This gift of God is a gift of eternal life, meaning for today and significance, yes, significance for tomorrow. And note now the, the time of the eating. It is not a past tense, but a present one, right? The tense of the language in the New Testament is present tense. He eats. He who eats, eats it now. Today the gift of Christ is as valid as ever. And we have his presence among us and in us, transforming and sustaining us. You know, the past, I guess, does surround us in the present. But the past doesn't have to dominate the present John Steinbeck tells the story of the migration of people from the Dust Bowl of the Midwest to California. Perhaps you, you had to read this book in high school. It's John Steinbeck's, I believe, most famous novel, The Great Grapes of Wrath. In this book, he evokes the harshness of the Great Depression and arouses sympathy for the struggles of the migrant farmers. Last night I was looking at some of the quotes from this wonderful book and I found online the book, chapter after chapter after chapter. If I look a little sleepy this morning, it's because I am, it's because I read the entire novel last night. I was up all night. It's a fascinating novel. Well, somewhere in the novel, I can't remember now because I'm sleeping, somewhere in the sleepy, somewhere in the grapes of, grapes of wrath, tells the family not to worry about packing pictures, reminders of the past, for they are going to a new land, a new opportunity. One of the characters in the novel responds, how can we live without our lives? How will we know it's us without our past? Now, vital as the past may be, we do live in the present, do we not? Christ is here, not as a memory long ago or far away. 
Christ is, is present to us in this supper which is before us. Not as a future hope, but as a present reality. Around the table of the Lord, we discover once again His love for us. And it's a love which sends us out, hopefully, to love others as Christ has loved us. At the table of the Lord, we discover hope and strength. It's a hope and strength which allows us to strengthen others in Christ and for Christ. Through this holy meal this morning, Christ gives us life that we might be sparks which enliven all of life, all of life, that we might be a light to the world. You know, in Matthew 5, 14, we're told that we, that we are the light of the world. We Christians are the light of the world. And sometimes I have to agree with a very cynical statement that I read years ago. If you Christians are the light of the world, if you Christians say that you are the light of the world, why is there so much darkness even today in the church of Jesus Christ? If Christians are the light of the world, why is there so much darkness? That's worth thinking about, right? Well, today, hopefully, we discover a new light, a light which can enliven and enlighten the world in which we live. This is truly our bread and our cup, not just for our enjoyment, but for our ministry. Christ gives himself to us that we might give ourselves for others. And I pray that we will do that. Thanks be to God. Amen. May we now affirm our faith as we say together what we believe before we come to the Lord's table. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the unity of the communion of saints of the entire human family. And we believe that this unity of the people of God must be manifest and active in that we love one another, that we give ourselves willingly and joyfully to one another, that we share one baptism together, that we eat of one bread and drink of one cup together, and we confess one name, one Lord, for one cause, with one hope, which is the height and the breadth and the depth and the love of Christ forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this is indeed the joyous feast of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is certainly not a Presbyterian table. This is not a restricted table. This is the Lord's table. Therefore, we invite not only the baptized and confirmed members of this church, but all who believe in Jesus Christ to gather around with us. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he then took the cup, and after a prayer said, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood. Drink all of it. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of Jesus Christ till he comes. May we pray together. Gracious God, you are indeed our God, and we are your people. And we are grateful that you have claimed us as your own. You have set us in the company of saints, past and present, among those who have made bold witness to your goodness and your truth. Your word opens up new futures where we see no way forward. 
You know, the places in our hearts where we are afraid, afraid of a future we cannot control, afraid of losing health and independence, afraid, of, afraid for the well-being of our children, afraid that past mistakes will ruin our future. So write the stories of your people deep into our hearts so that we may learn to trust you beyond our fears. Give us hearts and minds and spirits ready to trust and follow wherever your spirit leads, confident, yes, confident, confident that you will lead us beyond your embrace. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He took the bread and after prayer said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ, broken for you and for me. Eat all of it. And he then took the cup and after prayer said, This cup represents my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of it. May we pray. We thank you, gracious God, for the supper shared in the Spirit with your Son who makes us new and strong and brings us life eternal. We praise you for, for giving all good gifts in him and pledge ourselves to serve you even as you served us in Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. We read in Scripture that when they finished celebrating, they sang a parting hymn, and we do the same. We will close by singing the hymn number 509. <laughs>
beside you with your friend. Drives behind you to 